where you can zoom in and make it bigger, you can zoom down and make it smaller, we can move it side to side and pan. What we can also do is increase the tissue that we can see on that scan. Okay, so this is going to be a scan of a patient that came with a very specific condition. I believe you, this one they did an angiogram to look at the blood vessels because they're concerned with thoracic outlet syndrome. But if we look at this, you can see all kinds of different things based on the density by themselves. You can also make cuts into this with this scalpel tool. So we can remove the upper limb. So I'm like, oh, whoops, I wanted the upper limb. I don't want the head and neck. I'll just switch that. And now I've got the upper limb by itself. Yeah? So let's go over some of the skeletal anatomy that we just saw. Chromion. So that's the acromion of the scapula coming this way. Here's the spine of the scapula. So this is going to be what joint? The AC joint. So we have the AC joint, the SC joint. Pull this back up. Now you can also see that the scapula is rotated quite a bit in this abducted position. So that bony landmark here is what we were just talking about with pec minor and the short head of the bicep going to it. What is that? Coracoid process. So the coracoid process, this would be the glenoid fossa. Here's the head of the humerus. So we now can see that that glenohumeral joint allows for a lot, a lot of motion. Okay, when the actual humerus starts to hit the acromion, that's what's going to limit that motion. So that's the proximal end of the humerus. If we get this, get rid of that head again a little bit. And now we're looking at the distal end of the humerus here. So again, on the medial side of the humerus, which bone do we see? The elbow. So this one's going to be the ulna. The lateral side is going to be the radius. Okay, so remember that the radius head, the radial head looks like a golf tee, the ulna is kind of U-shaped. Okay? We follow that down to the wrist. And what do you notice about this patient that's similar to what we saw in that other one? Growth plates. Right? So maybe teenager, maybe they're not fully fused, but pretty close. But we can see that the radius is going to be attaching here towards the scaphoid and the lunate. Okay, so that's going to be the dominant bone-to-bone -bone connection on the distal end of the wrist, whereas we can see that space for the articular disc here where the ulna would be. Now, one thing we can do with this as well is we can change the render setting. So this is what's known as the opaque hard tissue. If you hit the eyeball, it will open this up. We can change this to an x-ray mode. If I change the brightness a little bit, we can now look at that as a 3D interactive x-ray. Okay. So we can see a lot of those same structures. We can still identify where the scaphoid and lunate are down here at the distal end of the radius. We can see where the epiphyseal plates would be. Now we can see this our orientation, we'll zoom in a little bit, of the bones articulating here at the elbow. So the olecranon fossa is the depression in the posterior distal end of the humerus. The olecranon process of the ulna fits in that gap. So what's limiting extension is when these two bones meet. What's going to limit flexion is when the opposite end, the coronoid process of the ulna, sits in the coronoid fossa. But you can see here that there's actual index. If we follow the attachment of the triceps distally, what bony landmark is that going to attach to? Right there. So that's the olecranon process of the ulna, right? We can also see the basic grouping pattern for the forearm flexors here that are going to start medially with the tendons coming into the palm of the hand, whereas the extensors would start laterally and then come back to the dorsum of the hand or the back of the hand. Yeah, so we'll see this more. We're going to take a look at that when we talk about the